I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for a new history video. As I've done the last few weeks, I posted a poll to let you viewers decide the topic I would cover this week. Most of the other polls I've done have been pretty lopsided, but with this one, the Great Famine won by a single percent. In fact, by the time this video goes up, it may no longer be in the lead, but I had to give myself enough time to get this video together. Either way, clearly people also want to see me do top 10 medieval scientists, and that's what I'll do for next week's video because this poll was so close. So in this video, we're going to talk about a particularly catastrophic event in 14th century Europe, the Great Famine, which ran from about 1315 to 1322. This event caused a lot of upheaval in Europe, especially in Northern Europe. There was massive loss of life, and there were many long-term implications. Despite that, this isn't really an event that most people are aware of, and the reason for that is likely the Black Death, which emerged just a few decades after this, and while the famine was definitely bad, the plague was way worse. Still, studying this is important, and in this video I'm going to cover three things. First, we're going to talk about what the famine was like by looking at some primary sources and discussing what the experience might have been like for 14th century Europeans. Second, we're going to talk about the potential causes of this famine. And third, we're going to talk about what the long-term implications of the famine were. So let's start by talking about the famine itself and what exactly happened. In 1315, there was a severe crop shortfall and this caused many people to go hungry, especially in Northern Europe. Europe didn't fully recover from this lack of food until 1323. This caused people to struggle to find food and ultimately resulted in the death of about 10% of Europeans. To introduce you to this event, let's take a look at the earliest source we have that describes the events of the plague. It comes from John of Trocolo, a 14th century Benedictine monk and chronicler who recorded the events of the reign of Edward II of England, who reigned from 1307 to 1327. This of course means that he recorded a lot of information about this famine in 1315. In his chronicle, John of Trocolo wrote the following. In 1315, hunger grew in the land. Meat and eggs began to run out. Capons and fowl could hardly be found. Animals died of pest, and swine could not be fed because of the excessive price of fodder. The price of wheat, beans, peas, barley, oat, and salt quadrupled or more, which was unheard of. The land was so oppressed with want that when the king came to St. Albans on the Feast of St. Lawrence, it was barely possible to find bread on sale to supply his household. There can be no doubt that the poor wasted away when even the rich were constantly hungry. Four pennies worth of coarse bread was not enough to feed a common man for one day. The usual kind of meat suitable for eating were too scarce. Horse meat was precious. Plump dogs were stolen off of people's porches. And according to many reports, men and women in many places secretly ate their own children. So John starts telling us about a huge shortfall of food which has resulted in an economic crisis. Food has become incredibly expensive, as has salt, which was important because it was really the only way you could preserve meat at the time. In fact, things are so bad in this situation that even the king himself has a hard time scrounging up food. He also makes it clear that the poor are in an even worse situation, and they're doing very desperate things as a result. While it's obvious that stealing people's pets and resorting to cannibalism are serious signs of desperation, the fact that John relates that horse meat is precious to people is also a sign of desperation. Horses were cherished, and they provided far more value than most livestock did as a result of their ability to work and go into battle. So while it may not seem quite as desperate to us today, it's on par with stealing people's plump dogs. So what was it like to be around during the famine? Well, obviously enough, not so good. Let's talk about the two main things that led to people's deaths during this time. One interesting thing about famine that seems a bit counterintuitive is that starving to death is not really a thing, at least not in the sense that you stop eating entirely and die from that. Instead, there are two major ways that people died during this time period, and they do both stem from hunger and desperation. First, dying from dehydration was very common. This is because people in their desperate state are willing to eat anything, and that isn't something the human body can always handle. We have a lot of different reports of people eating various horrible things in this period, with chroniclers often referring to their diets as strange diets. Those suffering from the famine ate things like rotten food, tree bark, insects, soil, and their own clothing after they boiled it. One of the more horrifying of these reports, at least for me, involves people digging up graves and eating decomposed human remains. More horrifying still are the reports of cannibalism, which we saw John of Trocolo allude to. We have multiple sources attesting to cannibalism in this time period, with some sources even talking about roaming bands of hungry people who would travel from town to town and turn them over in an attempt to find food, and they would resort to cannibalism if necessary. 
While some of these tales might be somewhat fanciful, it is fact that humans often do resort to cannibalism when left with no other options, so we can assume that it probably happened. At any rate, eating all of these things that we aren't meant to eat is obviously going to cause some gastric distress, especially vomiting and diarrhea, and this is often what actually killed people. It wasn't that they didn't eat anything, it's that they ate things the human body couldn't handle. The other way people often died in this period was from a disease that at the time was called St. Anthony's Fire. It gets its name because monks of St. Anthony were tasked with treating people who were suffering from this horrific disease, and from the fact that those who were afflicted with it were in so much pain that they felt like their bodies were engulfed in flame. Based on the reports, we know today that these people were suffering from a fungal infection called ergotism, and this relates directly back to the strange diets I mentioned earlier. People were so desperate that they were willing to eat grain that had grown moldy and rotten. The longer wet grain sat around, it gained more and more of a fungus called Claviceps purpurea, and a high quantity of that poisons the human body. But it doesn't cause you to die right away. Instead, it causes a gradual and horrifically painful decline. It might begin with some GI symptoms and some skin problems, but eventually the brain and the central nervous system are pushed beyond their limits, resulting in seizures, searing pain, gangrene, and insanity. If you ended up with an advanced case of ergotism, you were guaranteed to die. Ergotism itself may have resulted to some degree in people being more willing to resort to cannibalism, as aggression and anger were commonly the ways in which the fungal infection in the brain would present itself. Ergotism also had a massive impact on livestock, who are also vulnerable to this same kind of poison. People fed their livestock rotten grain infected with this fungus out of desperation, and the livestock experienced a similar fate. In the end, this famine lasted as long as it did, partly because of the large-scale death of livestock, and this was partly a result of ergotism, and partly a result of people slaughtering them out of desperation. Additionally, people tore through their grain storages, with some of these wandering mobs attacking cities and other locales that had grain stored in silos, and completely emptying them. People even went so far as to eat the grain that had been set aside to be planted for the next year, and this created kind of a rolling problem, and the famine wouldn't be overcome until 1323. So, those are some of the horrors of the famine. Let's move now to talking about the causes of the famine. To introduce that topic, let's take another look at John of Trocolo's writing on the famine. In addition to what we saw earlier, he also wrote the following about 1315. The dearth began in the month of May, and lasted until the feast of the Nativity of the Virgin. The summer rains were so heavy that grain could not ripen. It could hardly be gathered and used to bake bread down to the said feast day, unless it was put into vessels to dry. Around the end of autumn, the dearth was partly mitigated, but toward Christmas it became as bad as before. Bread did not have its usual nourishing power and strength because the grains were not nourished by the warm of summer sunshine. Hence, those who ate it, even in large quantities, were hungry again after a little while. So, John is telling us here that atypical weather patterns are to blame for this famine. There was too much rain and not enough warmth or sunlight. To put this into context, it's very important to be aware that before 1315 and for the last five centuries or so, European weather was very predictable and mild. This made it quite easy to know when to plant things since it always froze around the same time and it was always just rainy enough for crops. Around the year 1000, new agricultural technology was introduced, and for the next 300 plus years, there were pretty much always agricultural surpluses. Not just enough food to help people get by, more than enough food. So that made the events of 1315 even more of a shock to people. In short, climate change was a major factor in bringing about this famine. While John doesn't exactly say it, it seems likely that people planted their crops too early for the weather in 1315. He mentions rains, but it's also likely that freezes came later that year too, as late as May. Additionally, the freezes in the fall were probably earlier, and no one expected that either, and this all led to this shortfall. If we zoom out and look at Europe climatologically, it becomes clear that the year 1315 had an extremely different weather pattern than the norm. Climate historians called the time from about 800 to 1315 the medieval warm period. It was a time where temperatures were significantly warmer than they had been previously, and this climate pattern was the one that medieval farmers were used to. Then this changed in 1315 with the beginning of what is called the Little Ice Age, which itself lasted about 500 years and only ended once the Industrial Revolution was underway. So we know, both from a scientific analysis of world temperatures and from primary sources like John's, that the weather changed. But why did it change? Well, there isn't exactly one answer to this question. Instead, there are several different factors that likely led to the abrupt beginning of the Little Ice Age. First, the early 14th century was a time of volcanic activity, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. 
It's very possible that the lack of sun that John describes was at least partly the result of a great deal of volcanic dust in the atmosphere. This idea is further supported by a report of a red comet in 1315, which was likely the result of red dust in the atmosphere. Second, this period was likely also a time of decreased solar activity, and any time that happens, worldwide temperatures drop. Third, ocean currents may have changed in this time period, resulting in lower world temperatures. The oceans play a major role in regulating the world's temperatures, and any time those currents change, it causes changes in climate. Fourth, there is the early Anthropocene hypothesis. This theory was suggested by William Ruddiman. Anthropocene is a term scientists use to discuss our own climatological time period, and it refers to humans having a significant impact on climate. Pretty much all scientists agree that human-caused climate change is a thing right now, but William Ruddiman has suggested it began even earlier. For Ruddiman, the medieval warm period was the result of a huge leap forward in agriculture in both Asia and Europe, which led to population explosions. More and more trees were cut down for farmland, resulting in more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right around the time the Little Ice Age began, plague had begun tearing through Asia, resulting in a huge loss of life. This led to decreased agricultural activity in the region and a return to the normal climate, resulting in this Little Ice Age, which would be prolonged by the plague then also hitting Europe and having a similar impact. So those are the things that may have contributed to the weather change that resulted in this famine. Let's talk now about the long-term implications of this event. One of the more immediate outcomes of the famine was that it made the European population even more vulnerable to infectious diseases like plague. Plague would arrive in Europe in 1346, largely as a result of Mongol conquests and travel along the Silk Road, and when it got to Europe, there was a large segment of the population whose adolescence had occurred during the famine. This resulted in severely weakened immune systems that were even less effective at fighting off plague than they might have otherwise been. Another major outcome of this famine is that people began to doubt the order of society at the time. The church did its best to keep people fed, but even it was overwhelmed by the famine, and they proved unable to bring an end to the disaster, even though they promised that people performing penance would fix it. Seeing the church fail to fix the problem led to some people to doubt whether or not God was really on the side of the church. This was the first seed of doubt that would ultimately lead to an increase in heretical practices in the century, which in turn would lead to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Meanwhile, feudal overlords, in other words, the nobility who were supposed to take care of their peasants as part of their agreement, were unable to live up to their end of that bargain. There are some records of nobility doing even worse than just failing to help the lower classes too, with some nobility forcing those who worked their land to give them their usual payments, despite the fact that this meant leaving people with nothing. This led to the development of doubts about the usefulness of the feudal system during the 14th century, and by the end of the century, this medieval order of things had largely collapsed in Northern Europe. These doubts were, of course, also exacerbated by similar occurrences during the plague. Once again, in that case, the nobility failed to protect and provide for peasants, often abandoning them and retreating to the countryside, and the church once again failed to put an end to the crisis. The distrust people developed towards both the church and the nobility is best exemplified by a popular folktale called the Mouse Tower of Bingen that dates from a few decades after the famine. The tale is actually set in the late 10th century, but it was only recorded after the famine. The main figure in this story is the Prince Bishop of Bingen, a German town. Several nobles in the Holy Roman Empire at the time were both princes and bishops, giving them both power in the church and in the feudal hierarchy. So this one character embodies this shift in attitudes towards both the church and the nobility. The story goes as follows. The land of the Prince Bishop of Bingen had suffered a severe harvest shortfall, and food was in very short supply. Nevertheless, the bishop demanded that everyone pay him their full rents and taxes and money and in crops. He then used the money to buy up what food remained in the market and stored all of it in the fortress tower in which he lived. He dismissed all of his dependents and servants and then shut and locked all of the gates and doors to the tower in order to be sure that people would not try to enter and steal his hoard of food. But he need not have worried about that. The people were all gone. They had eaten every blade of grass and every kernel of grain in the land. Some had died while others had fled and left the bishop as the only living person in Bingen. Just as he was congratulating himself on having been clever enough to have survived the great hunger and comfort, he heard noises outside and at the doors. He rushed to the top of the tower and saw a terrible sight. All of the starving rats and mice from the entire region had smelled the food and were skittering towards his tower. Most versions of this story have kind of a cliffhanger, Twilight Zone-like ending like this one, where we're not really sure what the outcome is for this guy, but it's clear that he's going to get his comeuppance in one way or another from all of these rats and mice skittering towards his tower. 
Some versions of the story don't leave it up to our imagination, though, and outright say that he was devoured alive by these rodents. This story is definitely apocryphal, and that's why I refer to it as a folktale, but either way, it does represent the kind of doubt about the church and the nobility that people were beginning to develop in the 14th century in the wake of famine and plague. So, the Great Famine was rough, to say the least. A major shortfall caused by the changes in climate caused 10% of Europeans to die, and many of them quite painfully. This situation had many historical ramifications. Plague was worse a few decades later, and people began to doubt two of the major cornerstones of medieval Europe, feudal society and the church. Well, that does it for this week's video. Next time, I'll talk about the 10 most important medieval scientists. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on videos I've already made, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.